What's up guys, I'm Steve number 12. Got some sausage rolls. Check these bad boys out. Look how crispy that is. Thanks so much for the support. I'm gonna eat these and then we'll answer the questions. I'll... <laughs> What's up guys, Steve here, ask Steve number 12. Pretty exciting, we're on number 12 already. Soon we'll be on 13, then 14. <laughs> okay, if you're new here, you're not sure what this is, you ask me questions in the comments of this video and in the next Ask Steve, I answer all those comments. And then we just keep doing that infinitely until we run out of things to talk about. But I don't think that's possible because, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but uh, my, my videos are getting a lot more views than they used to. I'm getting a lot more comments than I used to, getting a lot more questions through Instagram. Everything's kind of crazy. I want to address a few things before we start this, I'm trying to get it over with because there's like, <laughs> multiple pages of questions here and it's kind of crazy but um uh, a couple dozen people have actually asked paid one-on-one -on -one consultations no i uh, don't have no plans to do them i'm not saying i'm never going to do them hey who's going to turn down money to give people advice right i'm pretty sure that's like the richest people in the world that's what they do they people pay them money and they give them advice uh no paid membership for like a question thing i'm not going to go into deep deeper financial questions and everything just so like you pay me a little bit of money i'm not going to go crazy with you on your businesses it's not something i'm interested in and it's also not something that i'm comfortable with there's plenty of people out there who are accepting way too much money to be honest for their really terrible advice because they actually have no idea what they're doing but they're still accepting money through you know discord membership things and patreons but that's what i'm not trying to call out anyone but their advice is kind of trash and uh you know I'm, i feel like my proof is in the pudding and I got two stores that are pretty successful and I uh, have multiple other things going on that I'm pretty good at and I've shown over the past few years and I'm really good. And I understand why people would want to do a consultation because I am pretty transparent and I'm trying my best and I'm put, laying it all out there online, right? Like I, uh, nothing to smoke and mirrors. I'm not hiding deals. I'm not, I'm showing everything. I'm pretty uh, complacent and whatever. I don't know the words, but no paid thing to get further things. There is a membership you can do on YouTube. It's a dollar a month and I pretty much just buy junk food with it on my lunch breaks. So if you want to buy me a sausage roll and a donut every once in a while, feel free to support one dollar a month. If you feel like I've helped you in any way, whether out of the last few, uh, last year we've been taking this YouTube pretty seriously, if you support me, feel free. But there is no reason to. Don't mind. If you can support by leaving some comments, liking videos, all the stuff you guys are already doing, I don't mind. We'll do these ask these forever or until I die or until I... <laughs> my voice runs out of voice because even now my voice is already pretty dry so sorry i already wasted two minutes of video so yeah thanks so much for all the support guys let's get into this this might be a two video thing because there's six pages here and some of these questions are quite long so <laughs> yeah uh let's get into this lunchbox tv number one lucky first do you ever collect master sets does that style of collecting interest you or do you prefer to collect single cards from sets so a long time ago when I very first started, I collect base jungle fossil, whatever. I think most people did, right? I collect completed complete sets, and then I worked up to complete, like completing like PSA nine and PSA ten sets. But now these days, I just like to find cards that I buy, or find cards that I really like, and just buy them. And usually, most of the cards these days that I really like don't come in sets because they're like pretty expensive. They're like rare Japanese promo cards. But I will say, this is the same thing I've said since the very start of this YouTube channel, since like four years ago. My main goal is to get as many cards as possible. Every card you see around me, every single thing you see around me, this Frostmoth PSA 10. What else we got here? We got a Rayquaza VMAX PSA or Rayquaza V from VMAX Climax VMAX 10. These cards are part of my collection. Yes, I'm actively selling them. Yes, they're on set for sale online. But one day, I'm going to choose not to sell anymore. I'm just going to turn everything off and whatever's left, that's part of my collection. I'm completely happy. I don't need complete sets. I don't need... Sorry, I don't need fancy... The hiccups are already kicking in straight away. I don't need fancy labels. I don't need anything. I, even PSA 10s, I don't exclusively keep those. Whatever's left, whatever I build and whatever's left, that's my collection. Every time I list something, it's a part of my collection slash inventory. If it sells, I ship it out. I buy something else to add to the... All I'm concerned with is total value and getting as many cards as possible. So that's my style of collecting. And I feel like, no, it's not fancy. No, it isn't like clickbait worthy where i can show off my psa 10 complete sets no it's not like my you know check out these whatever psa 9 first edition base holders i got every single card from psa 9 first edition base that's cool a lot of people like that that's set collecting that's collecting in a nutshell but for me i got a few cards from psa 9 this a few cards psa 10 i got a few cards from here so they're raw they're played chuck those in a binder it's no big deal i just like to get everything as much as i can at the best deal i can that's pretty much it and i feel like it has a little more character to it you know a bunch of my collection i got I don't even, I have like $10,000 spent on plushies 
and I count them part of my collection. I got figurines that I spent a few hundred to a thousand dollars on. I got, I got, it's just empty boxes and I got, you know, EX boxes and old Botsy boxes empty. They are still part of my collection. They're like a thing, even though they got a little bit of value in them and I bought them at a cheaper price. I'm happy to keep them, but that's, everything's a part of it. So, you know, it's not really what the question you ask, but that's how I generally see things these days. I feel like most people, you'll feel a lot better just like, trying to get away from collecting things and finishing a set, finishing a set, and just getting as much as you can, not being cautious with your money, you know, just buying the deals where you see them, don't overpay on shipping, try not to go crazy on a new release, just pick up things along the way and have fun. So that, that's my advice. B Talberth, are the unlimited Japanese E-Series cards more rare than first edition? I have noticed a price difference, but I don't know much about the printing of that error. Also, I've purchased a few times from Kimmy's cards and the experiences have been fantastic. Your conditions, descriptions, I have been incredibly on point, not to mention the packaging. Okay. Thank you so much. That's a, I didn't, that's a, that's a, thank you, B. Talbot. I think that, are you Blaine? Oh, thank you, Blaine. Kim says all the time, it was Blaine. Blaine, Blaine's making me work. I've written, oh. Oh, making me blush. All right. Are unlimited Japanese E series rarer than first edition? So, pretty much E series number one expedition. There's like 28 cards that are printed in Unlimited from like some special release of like a pre-release before Expedition was ever released. The E-Series started their cards. There's a whole bunch of them that are Unlimited. They're way more expensive than their first edition counterparts. The rest of the sets, they printed more first edition than they did Unlimited because they always printed first edition first and then they removed the stamp afterwards after a few weeks or whatever of printing. Unlimited is technically rarer. Some people ask for more money. But in my experience as a seller, generally first edition is more desirable because it has that cool stamp that everyone likes. And that's what I go with. But there are some things that people want to get like, what can I use as an example? Uh, people want to get like, let's say a polytoad from like Split Earth. I think it's from Split Earth. Some people who want a PSA 10 polytoad and there's a bunch of first edition ones available will pay a certain price. And then there's only one unlimited available. There's less available. So the people who want like that certain card, they have to pay up. But in general, if you're just collecting E-Series, just get whatever cheaper. You don't have to go all first edition and all unlimited. Just like I said before, you don't have to have these complete perfectly sets that like, you know, you have a little bit mixed up because uh, I think it builds character, but yeah, the E1 cards are definitely more rare and definitely more expensive, but except for Ponyta, Ponyta comes in like a trainer mag and is not rare, but everything else. Um, Thank you so much about the, the purchases from my single store. I really try my best because uh, Kim doesn't do any condition checking because she has um a problem with like her eyes. She can't see very well, especially up close. She has a problem with focusing. So I do all the condition checking. And in my eyes, I like to oversell the cards like or undersell, oversell. I don't know. My played cards, they're pretty good condition. Damaged cards, if it's got a little bit, I just call it damage. If it's got a little bit of play where I just call it played. It's generally like I want people to be happier with the cards than, you know, to be upset with the condition. It's, it's what I'm trying to achieve. So I'm happy that you're happy. Andrew Carlander, 3160. Why can there be such a big buy it now price ranges for specific cards? Japanese Rayquaza Gold Star currently has listings for about 12 to 20K. Some people seem to list buy it now prices insanely high, way above recent sales. What actually sells? How can we price to sell faster? Or are most people listing way too high optimistic price without a clue? If you know what I mean. Expensive cards seem to stay listed for an awfully long time. Thanks a lot, mate. All right. It's a little bit psychological because like rare stuff or expensive stuff that kind of, it can be rare or just expensive is a lot harder to obtain. So most people that have something like that, it's a lot harder to let go. Because for me, if you look on my eBay right now, I have about a hundred listings. I have a lot more than I, I probably have like 500 listings way above market, like way, way above market on a lot of cards that are just a little bit harder to get. And I'm not interested in selling them at today's price. And they're more of like showcase listings. Like, you know, I have, I can't think, it's so, so many. What do I think of? Some like my uh, Espeon VMAX from Altard, the VMAX EV's Hero promo. They're, it's, it's like a $800, $900 card. I think I have like 10 of them or 20 of them listed for like 1500 to 2000. That's not the current price, but if it reaches that price eventually, that's when I'm happy to sell. When you get to the five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar range, most people with expensive cards, they don't really want to put them at the market price in case it ships and they sell and then eBay fees and everything goes crazy. 
they would always like to price them a little bit higher and then do a buy it now best offer kind of work out with the buyer. So when they get an offer, because if, what am I saying? All right, all right. So I lost my train of thought. I'll go back. When they get an offer, they want to see who they're selling it to. For when you're selling a rare item, if I have an item list for 10,000, someone offers me 6,000, if it's a zero feedback from some random country that I'm not comfortable like shipping to that much, I'm going to be way less likely to accept the offer of 6,000 if I want to accept 6,000, if that's the market price. Whether it's like a US buyer at like 6,000 and they have 2,000 feedback or 100 feedback. You know, if I'm selling a pretty rare item and they're like just around the corner in my hometown, I'd be way more likely to accept that best offer and work it out with them and we can do an in-person deal or something like that. And through best offer, a lot of people, they like to just have the showcase listing and they're not really intentionally trying to sell. They're just trying to show off their items. Like I have my Snapchat and a list of like 200,000. Yeah, if someone really rich wants to go and hit buy now on that card, feel free. But it's more of a showcase thing. I'm trying to just get views on the store. I'm trying to flex a little bit, you know. It's it's my hard work. I paid a lot of money for the item. I feel like I can have it listed and flex a little bit. And I feel like everyone uses that excuse to do whatever. But, oh my god. i got to get this hiccup problem fixed. <laughs> I don't know how. Um, In saying that, it can be incredibly frustrating as a buyer. If you want to get a Rayquaza PSA 10 and everyone has 12,000, 15,000, 20,000 listed and the last price is like 8,000 and then you offer 8,000, they just decline or don't respond because they're either not looking to sell or something like that. Usually most rare cards, if you want to get the actual market price on them, you have to win them on auction. And to win them on auction, you have to wait. And to wait, it really sucks because you're a collector and you want it now, you want it now, you want it now, you want it now, but you just have to wait. So I hope I uh, explained that well, if you feel free to let me know. Oh my God. Start of this video, I was going to ask a few questions to the people who regularly watch and I completely forgot. Before we go any further, I actually just want to ask a few questions to the regular viewers of this channel. You know, we're 13 minutes in. Most people are asking these by now. I want your help. I want your support. I want you to let you know how I'm going. Am I posting too many videos? Am I posting not enough videos? Is there other types of videos you want me to post? Do you want me to post more helpful videos? Do you want to see some things on my card stores, me just sorting cards sitting there talking? Do you want to do this? I, I want your comments. I want your feedback. I want your everything. I don't want to, you know, just post videos and show myself all the time. Uh, you know, as fun as that is, it is, it's not the idea that I had with the channel when I started off. I want the most regular viewer feedback from you guys. I don't want to, you know, I need some discourse. You know, I'm asking this from you. I'm sitting here answering your questions. I want a little bit of discourse, whether you message me on Instagram or just comment on this video. I want to know how I'm doing. Uh, I will be doing more eBay review videos. A lot of people want those. Definitely. Sometimes I don't really have the time of the day to do them, but it's not an excuse, right? I can do them. I just need to know a level of like, how much do people want them? What do you want? What more would you want to see of? Do you like the long videos? Because you know, this Ask Steve is going to be like an hour long, maybe, maybe even more longer. Do you want more longer videos or do you want the videos to be short and sweet? Would you rather me break them up into multiple parts? Like when I first started this YouTube channel, I didn't really realize the power of YouTube and how much, how actual beneficial it was for me. Like, I'm not going to lie. This YouTube channel has been incredibly beneficial for me. Not even the fact that, you know, I almost got $500 paid to me from YouTube in the last month because I got so many views. It's honestly nuts. $500 fucking dollars. It's like, what? 500? I'm just sitting here. I'm just doing all the stuff I normally would do. But I just, you know, I still bought like an expensive camera, an expensive microphone and a computer and a desk to do all this. And I'm still down like maybe fifteen hundred dollars on my setup but i'm sure after a few more months that'll be all paid and then it's it's nuts and then don't even forget the fact that like how many buyers have i connected with through youtube man it's just like you guys have been supporting me so much so i want to know like just tell me just use me use me for as long as i'm making videos like i said at the start it's completely free my advice definitely is better than almost 99 percent of these chumps giving advice on youtube i'm not trying to say that as being arrogant it's just like, it's not saying like I'm better than them. It's just like statistically and factually, I am better than them. And I'm, I told you my ego was large, but it's just like, I am better than them, but I'm also willing to help use me while I'm here. So sorry for breaking this video up and not answering questions, but let's get to the next one. Diamond Hands Pokemon. That's a terrible name. Hi, Steve. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and experience. Uh, vintage prices have dropped. Do you think the new levels are here to stay because people are focusing on modern? Perhaps everyone with nostalgia for base set have revisited by now. And going forward, there will be nostalgia for the sets that were around at retail when people first started collecting. Perhaps in 15 years, the nostalgia will be with Sword and Shield. What do you think vintage prices will do in the next few years? All right. It's like a crystal ball collection. I don't really do that here, Diamond Hands Pokemon. But for the sake of it, I'm going to help you out. First of all, you said in 15 years. I feel like using any sort of terminology, 15, 10, 20, 30, 
you just don't even think about it anymore. Anyone saying 15 years has no idea what they're doing and has no idea what's going to happen. I think you should think in one, two, five, five at the maximum. Like I think five years ago on Pokemon, things were like everything was crashing, just like it was apparently because the vintage prices are now. You know, just think a one year ahead, two years ahead. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what crazy things in the world are going to happen. Don't think so far ahead. You're just going to waste your time. Secondly, will they have nostalgia for Sword and Shield? I mean, most likely Sword and Shield prices will probably trend up on booster boxes. I mean, everything's always trend up. I feel like that's a pretty safe take to make. The problem when it comes to actually buying and investing in what's going to go up is like... Once you enter that realm of conversation, you immediately have to add in everything else that could possibly also a good investment. That's why I hate talking about Pokemon investing. It's my least favorite topic. I mean, you didn't ask about it directly, but it's, the question's kind of weighted towards that. So when you talk about Sword and Shield, because if a box is $500 now and in five years it's 700 it probably will be more, let's just be honest. But like, you got to think, could you put that 500 in a in an account that makes 6% year on year and you end up with like, you know, however much that is could you make 10 percent on it just like going into stocks or etfs or smp like you know what i mean it's just like once you talk about how much something would be if you're actually just trying to gain money through investing whatever this means you have to think of everything else that could also be seen as an investment so secondly with the vintage prices everything spiked because of covid the the world got like multiple trillions of dollars pumped into it and everything went up like crazy right so I feel like most prices you should be looking at compared to where they are, you should look at, see if you can find the price of the item before 2020, like late 2019 to early 2020 is when you should be looking at like the prices of an item just to see where it is. That's my advice with vintage stuff. Cause I was selling a lot of old school stuff back then. And the, I think even in late 2019, we kind of had a run before COVID. We were like, we were running and then COVID happened and then we all exploded. So do I think these are the new levels for cards? I feel like everything will constantly reprice itself, find a new flow, find new people to buy, find whether it's up, down, or completely flat. It's just a healthy market currently that we're in. It is an incredible market currently that we're in. There's no crazy tendies where people grade like $10 cards and they become $500, you know. $10 card, you grade it, it's usually like 40 to 50. The margins are set in, they're like 10 to 20 bucks. If you have a niche card, that's not that many of them graded, you can make a little bit more. If you've got a, neat, a really, really modern card that's popular, you grade a bit, you can't make much because everyone's selling it. We're an incredibly competitive and healthy market. That's how it should be, as it's good, as things just steadily increase over time from supply dwindling out and collectors just hoarding and hoarding more stuff and more people coming in because Pokemon's incredible. Secondly, let me just focus on this. What do I think vintage prices will do in the next few years? I don't think this thing with like vintage is crap and like modern is just amazing. It's always been like this. Modern cards have always had more stuff. You can't, because you, you can't talk about vintage cards. The only reason why vintage cards got so much talk over the last few years is because prices went up. Once prices like stop going up or, or down, whichever way with vintage cards, no one wants to talk about it anymore. But if a new set comes out in two months, that's a talking point. Three months later, another new set. Three months later, not, you know what I mean? They're just not many people talk about the vintage cards. They still do what they do. You know, I still listed a, I still got like a Neo Lugia 10 from Japanese Neo Genesis, and it's like a $1,500 card. That's really expensive. That's more expensive than like any card that comes out in the most recent sets. It, apart from like maybe Umbreon VMAX, Ultar, maybe there's a few more. That's over the last few years. I still think like vintage prices are pretty high. And how do you think they do in the next few years? This is a crystal ball question. I hate answering these, but I'm just going to do this one because I don't, I, I don't the thing. I don't think about this stuff. I don't even care. I buy cards at certain prices. I list them at up next prices and I move on with my life. But vintage cards, there's a lot of them. There is a lot of them. Vintage Japanese and vintage English. There is a shitload of them. Like there's literally so many every single week, every single day. There's new collections popping up from people that have just found them and selling them. It is honestly unreal. The prices will most likely I don't know. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> just think about it, right? If most of the vintage cards are just like not worth that much, even if cards double, they go from like what raw ten to twenty dollars. PSA ten vintage on, on English is really a scam. If you think about it, you got like twenty dollar base set Blastoise played, hundred dollars near mint, and then it's like what sixteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars PSA ten. I mean, what's going on with that? I mean, it's like even that Neo Gen Lugia I, I talked about. That card's like $150, $200 near mint. 
mint condition maybe and it's $1,500 2000 PSA 10 how much more can it actually move like the multiplier is already so insane so um I'm not too sure I think that you should invest your time on becoming a card flipper rather than a card investor because flipping is way more fun you actually get to touch the stuff <laughs> Karu 19 hey Steve as a buyer for new modern cards to grade do you individually buy from listings or second on the second hand market or mass buy from card stores every time I mass buy from card stores I get way worse condition cards on average and I'm reading this question terribly okay one second, I'll redo this whole question. That was terrible. Hey, Steve, as for buying new and modern cards to grade, do you individually buy from listings on the secondhand market or buy in mass from card stores? Every time I buy from a store, I tend to get fewer higher, fewer PSA 10 candidates that from picking them up by listings. I feel like that's pretty obvious, right? If you're buying quantity 10 from whichever store you're buying from, which are around the world, TCG Player, Troll and Toad, all these Japanese stores, all this stuff. I feel like it's pretty obvious if you just find the listings that are like, you know, well-centered, don't have edgeware, you're going to have a better rate of higher grades i feel like that's uh pretty obvious and you know because card stores are selling near mint they're not selling gem mint so you know they're just putting near mint there's a little bit of edgeware here and there modern japanese and modern english is terrible condition usually out of the pack like it's really bad so let's get to the rest of this question i asked this for some higher end cards sure it would be worth buying individually and taking the time to look at each card but for ars for example you can see how that isn't very efficient i also think you're wrong i feel like it is way more efficient to buy listings even if you're paying a few dollars more individually looking at the photos talking with the sellers getting more photos wherever you can get anything from if less your time is worth 100 200 300 dollars an hour i feel like putting that little bit more effort to get like better condition cards will always be worth it it's never not gonna be worth it unless you are grinding through thousands of psa 10s i'm not sure but i still do that to this day you know if this card is like five to ten dollars and there's like a listing with four up and i can see the conditions i will buy that rather than buying four from a random card store it's always going to be more beneficial for your time unless you're you know earning 100 200 300 an hour but yeah that's pretty much your question um yeah look it, it's hard right because you know it's easy just to hit buy 99 of like a there's one card I bought the other day, some modern card. It's like a Gengar from a new set. I bought them in English and I bought them in Japanese. They were like 50 cents in English and they were like 30 yen in Japanese. And I just mass bought all of them. None of them were gradable. If I just looked online and actually looked at the looked at the conditions or whatever, I just sent them all to a, my card store to just sell them for like a dollar each. And I'm going to make a little bit of money on them. Not as much as I would have if I graded them. But if I just put that little bit more effort into finding one or two listings actually showing good condition, I would have saved a lot of time and money. And you realize even me for my time, I have a pretty big stores and I sell quite a lot. I still find the singular listing because it's, it's just so much better than mass buying and then getting disappointed because mm. sorry, most modern cards are pretty set in stone with their pricing. And if you buy at the market price, you can't really sell. Am I, am I sweaty on my back? No, nah, really. it's getting hot guys. I don't know how I'm going to do videos in the summer because, uh, <laughs> Ooh, it's fucking hot in Australia. All right, first page done. That's pretty good. Uh, what are we, 23 minutes in? First page. All right. But Farg, Fargan Bastard. That's a crazy name, bro. I need a little advice. Well, I'm here for you. I need a little advice in knowing what's worth holding on to and the best practices on how to store raw cards. Generally, I buy three to five booster boxes of each English set and one or two cases of Japanese. I will also buy several cases of Pokemon Center ETBs. I will maybe open one case of ETBs just to get that dopamine and a couple boxes of English. Wow, you are rich. Holy crap. You're buying so much sealed product. All right. Let's adjust this. So you want to know what's worth holding on to and the best practices on how to store raw cards. Oh, wow. You have more of the question. I didn't realize. I didn't realize this question was all of this. All right. My issue is I'm not sure if it's worth holding on to all the reverse holo rares, the non-holo rares, or even the non-holo, not holo non holo commons uncommons of popular pokemon i see in some of your videos that you will buy rare hollows and even non hollows of cards and grade them usually these are older sets though so i'm not sure if there could be any really value in the future of holding on to all the bulk of isai universe 151 or an english set like paldia and vault what would you suggest to someone who's thinking ahead about value of cards in the future someone who has started to sell on ebay with regards to how to handle bulk they either open themselves or buy from others all right i'm going to give you a, i'm going to give you a little bit of advice that you're probably not going to like first of all 
you're buying all these sealed boxes, right? So you're opening them, you're just losing value like crazy. That's perfectly fine because you're supposed to have fun as trading cards, have fun. That's amazing that you can do that and you can just do it constantly and you have fun, you enjoy, it, you don't care about the value side. That's perfectly great. What you should hold on to, in my opinion, sleeve everything hollow and reverse hollow, any EX, GX, V, whatever they have these days. Non holo rares and below, unless it's like a really popular Pokemon, Espeon, maybe a Gengar, maybe an Umbreon, whatever they have. Yeah, keep those sleeved up, keep them to the side. But you know, even modern bulk V Star Universe, this stuff's all pretty much just like worthless. And even if, like, even if the cards become valuable, you look, you're talking like one cent to like one dollar. And that's a hundred X, right? But like, you could just follow on to the next device, I'm going to say. You could just do whatever I'm going to say next. I'll get to it. But like, and then just buy the single card down the line when you want to get more of that if it becomes a decent card and maybe you want to grade some in the future. So what I suggest you do, open your cases, open your boxes, keep all the hollows, rares, reverses, everything, ultra rares, everything. Sleeve it up and I'll show you how in a second. But with the bulk, you say you're starting to sell on eBay. Maybe make like 100 card lots or 200 card lots, auction them off, start them at $10, start them at $15, figure out how much it has cost you to ship them and then just get rid of that stuff. It is not worth long-term holding on to bulk of modern cards. Just get rid of all of it. Dump it all. Most of the non holo cards that I grade. Can't really. I don't really know what to say. Um, uh, can I, is there any over here? Maybe. Maybe. Be careful not to touch most of these. But yeah. Most of the non holo cards that I grade. Are kind of like these older sets. And. You know. This is Diamond and Pearl. And even these aren't really worth that much. I can still. Buy them. Continuously. For like. For like 20 to 50 cents a card. You know, and that's 15 year old bulk and the booster boxes are like 10 years old, 15 years old. What you should do with your bulk is just dump it, get rid of it, sell it to a bulk reseller, sell it on eBay, make a hundred card lots, auction it all off. Do that. Is my shirt sweating? Damn. I think it is. <laughs> um, and just get rid of it, right? Sleeve all your other stuff. I'll show you how I do it. I keep my cards in these. Oh, I just knocked my camera. I keep these cards in these. 400 count boxes. You know, I use 800 count and I also have really big 3200 count boxes for like lots of bulk. But for cards like this, you know, if you watch my uh, $10,000 PSA submission recap, all the cards are in here. And eventually when I do submit them to PSA, I'll put them in card I'll put them in card savers and I'll just sleeve them up, send them to PSA. These boxes are absolutely perfect. And sometimes I'll see if I have a box here ready to go. <clears throat> What's this? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I know there's a lot of breaks. I'm just disappearing. So this box is labeled EX Era Bulk, right? And inside, you'll be really surprised to see. Can I show this? Looks like some EX Era Bulk. Well, this one's from Diamond and Pearl, actually. So. We pretty much have a whole box of it. I've already condition checked all these cards. I've sleeved them. These are all pretty much gem mint ready to go, ready to grade. A lot of these look like they're diamond and pearl though. So I, I don't know why I write EX era bulk, but maybe there was EX era bulk here once in a time and now there's diamond and pearl. But for example, this is an 800 count long box. These are also really good for having more cards. I think having smaller boxes that you can move around quite easily instead of those big boxy 3200 and 500 or 5000 count boxes would be way better, but Keep all your holo rares and why, why, I mean, why are you opening them? Are you trying to complete sets? Are you trying to grade the cards? Because maybe you should put them in binders because, you know, complete your sets. But if you want to keep all the extras safe, chuck them in those things, close them up, put them in a closet, revisit them another day. Um, I hope that helps. And you can sell the bulk and maybe you can buy some singles. I personally think if you have a thousand bulk cards and you can sell them for like $30, $20 to someone and you can buy like one single that's worth $20, I think it's way better having a $20 single. Especially if it's like a good single too. Maybe not like a modern card. Maybe you can buy like like an old, like a played Fossil Gengar or something. Or a played like Dragonite or whatever floats your boat. Finish that off. Because I think it's way better than holding all that bulk. Or you can sell them for $1 each on eBay. And that would be a completely nuts thing to do. Eugene Kim, 5127. When did you consider some? Or when do you consider something repeatable? I come across cards I can grade and get a premium. But when I just research last sold data... There's sometimes months between sales. Oh, this is the tale of the... I think I talked in the last video about repeatable sales and something you should try and focus on. Yeah, repeatable sales is stuff that's like a popular set 
popular Pokemon, all that other stuff. I think cards that sell almost every week is a repeatable sale, as there's actually, you know someone's going to buy. Like, you know, just cards that I'm going about to hold up, these are not repeatable sales. This uh, Frostmoth, that's not a repeatable sale. But if you think about it, a VMAX Climax character rare, that's kind of a repeatable sale. You know, if I found a way to sell these at 25 US dollars each and I grade them for 20, like 15 and I buy the card for like 3 or 4 dollars, that's a repeatable sale. But trying to sell a Frostmoth by itself is not a repeatable sale. But maybe I have a mystery product and I sell them at 25 USD PSA 10 Japanese graded card. That could be a thing that I could do or anyone could do. That could be a repeatable sale. Then you have a listing that people multiple buy. But cards are a little bit could be more seen as repeatable i don't think i have any uh right in front of me unfortunately um oh this one here this is a charizard v star i make about 15 to 20 dollars when someone buys one of these i sold 13 yesterday to one person and the last week or two i sold like maybe five or ten yeah it's 15 to 20 dollars but big butt big butt oh fuck me okay big <laughs> big butt I can't do this, man. I can't take myself seriously. It's 15 to $20. It's really low margin. It's quite fast. But you can't only focus on that because it goes faster than it comes in. And if you're trying to make something, you know, consistent and me, I need to make like a living wage. So I need to have these things that are repeatable, but I also need to rely on the good stuff that only sells every two or three months. Because yeah, you got only cards that sell over two or three months. But if you got 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 cards and all of them only sell every two or three months, well, three months is 90 days. You got 1,000 cards to sell one every 90 days. That's still 300 cards a month. You see how I mean? Eventually, the idea is to build up into something that can, like, you have cards that sell every three, four, six months at a higher margin. But to get through the weeks, you got to sell the cheap stuff. And I'm, honestly, I think most people shouldn't even touch this stuff because if you try to compete with me on this, like, Charizard SAR, and you bought the card raw, and you finally find one gem mint, and you finally get one PSA 10, and you wait three months for it to return, and you put it on eBay, and you see that Steve has it, and you only make $15, well, you're going to be pretty pissed off. And I'm not the only person that does that. There is literally hundreds to 200 to 500 people that are selling modern graded cards, English and Japanese, and I don't even think anyone could should do it. Because you, you guys watch the videos, right? Like, this background doesn't change that often. There's still lots of cards, and it's always adding to it. It very rarely goes down. My whole idea is to get more, but... I don't think many people should touch the cheaper cards too great. I think you should try to focus on singles and then you understand things sell a lot faster and then eventually focus on the greater ones that do sell every three months, four months. Magic Ham 911. G'day, Steve. G'day, mate. <laughs> I wonder if you might know what the profit margin is for your single store versus your main eBay store. I'm selling singles on eBay in Australia and I'm considering starting grading. Thank you. Hello, Magic Ham. Glad to help you. Um, I will take a sip of water first. All right. Um, what my profit margin is for my single store versus my main eBay store. So percentage wise, the single store is a lot more profitable than my graded card store. I can't tell you the exact margin because it's, uh, there's a lot of cards, there's a lot of sales and it's a little bit personal, you know, it's a little bit personal. You tell me your margin, I'll tell you mine. But I will say on a graded card, like I just mentioned, $20 on this, so it cost me around, like, you know, I think this card, when I bought them, they're a bit cheaper now. I probably bought these for like 50 to $60, grade them for like 30 I sell them for like 138 So after fees and shipping, God, I'm not making much at all. What's that, like 13 20 18 th So you generally, like, the cost is around like $108 with fees and shipping card cost plus grading. I'm selling them for $130, uh, maybe it's like 110 yeah. So around like $25 at the moment. Maybe it's a little bit more for like ad fees and stuff like that that I'm not counting in and all this other stuff. So, you know, $15 to $25, like I said before, on that Charizard. Yes, that's a lot of money to make $15 to $25 on $100. What's that? 25%? It's pretty easy. 25% only, but it's $20, $25. On a single card, you know, I sell a lot of cards, maybe like $5, $10, $3. Some of those cards only pay $1. 10 cents, 20 cents, 50 cents. It's a single store is huge multiplier, but you can list a lot of cards of single cards and not sell that many. And it's very painstaking and it's extremely time consuming. In the time it takes me to list one of these, I think there's like 40 deep inside there. There's 40 of these bad boys. It's one listing with quantity 40, whatever. 
single cards for me is every single card gets a new photo. Every single card has to be placed back in the right place in the inventory block. It is a lot more work. It is absolutely insane. If I if I pointed the camera down at this desk, there's singles fucking everywhere. <laughs> so it's hard. So when it comes, when you want to start grading, eventually you should grade two things based on condition. You've got a really nice card you want to grade. Something like this Charizard V-Store, V-Star, it's probably worth grading still, even if you have one copy. You sell it, you can make your $25, $30 more than you would have just selling it near Mint Raw. But grading is definitely condition-based and rarity-based. you got some rare cards, maybe they grade PSA 7 to 9. You're not comfortable selling it as like a near Mint Raw card, and you can get a lot more money if it's a PSA 9 or 10, usually on an older rare card. I would suggest grading those as well. Yeah, I'm always there on Instagram if you want to message me like, Steve, would you grade this? And maybe if you show me like, how much you paid and PSA 10 examples of price. I can help you work it out if it's worth grading it. But yeah, profit margin. Single stores make a lot more money percentage wise, but graded card stores make a lot more money, money wise. But they also cost a shitload more money. You know, when I, when I get a PSA submission back of a hundred cards, it costs me almost $3,000. And then I have to sit on that 3000 until I sell everything. And if some of these cards, they don't, they take a while to sell. It's $30 for me, each card just sitting there on the shelf. Like, look, it's just like, you know, I have to pay a huge insurance premiums just for like all these cards sitting here. It's kind of stupid, but hey, it is what it is. KK Singh. I've been a collector for a while now and constant and cons... That's a new word. I've been a collector for a while now and consequently my collection have grown quite a bit. Oh, I don't think you're... English languages first. Okay, that's fair. And I'm looking to sell some of my stuff on eBay. Why do some new eBay users appear to have a seemingly unlimited dollar amount of listings for selling while my account has a monthly limit of approximately 3000? Is it necessary to open a business account to have higher selling limits? I'm located in Asia, but I don't know if that relates to the problem I have. Thanks again, Steve. Hey, mate. Okay. Great question. That's actually a really good question. So usually brand new eBay accounts gets no selling limits because, you know, they don't want people to make new eBay selling limits. Or they don't they don't want me to do that. Bro, I can't talk. I need, I need some water, man. I'm sorry. What am I doing? My mouth gets so dry because the aircon's like right there. But they don't want people to make new eBay accounts and just put items up for $20,000 and scam people. So you start off really small, but it, it, it does grow. If you like, like, I think I have a few, I'm not sure where I've answered it before, if it's on like a Ask Steve video or on a dedicated eBay help video, but I would suggest just selling things in mass as much as you can. Auctioning items off, starting them at $5 auctions and just shipping a lot of things and showing eBay like, Hey, I'm a seller. I'm actually selling things. I'm shipping them and buyers are receiving them. So whatever your limit is, try to just list the listing limits. Oh my God. I can't do these, man. The hiccups. So whatever your selling limit is, try to reach it and try to list the amount of cards that they have and then click the request to list more button or call eBay up and talk to them about it and just explain on the phone, hey, I'm a new seller. I'm trying to get more limits. I want to list more. But they want eBay wants to see you actually complete sales and buyers receive their items. They don't want to see you just list up and not sell it. So I suggest doing auctions. I suggest keeping the auctions low, finding stuff. Maybe if you paid $10 each for like 30 cards, just start the auctions at $10, have the correct postage paid and then sell those and then just keep doing that rolling over breaking even like listings to get higher limits eventually and then learning how to sell a little bit along the way i definitely recommend you looking at my ebay brand new ebay guides it's on my one of my playlists because that's you're the perfect type of person that i made those for those aren't really for like the experienced sellers or people that know what they're doing they're for brand new users and that's why i made them so let me know if you do watch those and let me know if they help you out sorry sorry that my voice is so bad today and my keep stumbling i I'm trying better, but I sometimes I, my my brain just like stops. I, I might be dyslexic. All right. Um, Card Collectors UK. Do you have any advice into how you track your sales? I've created a basic Excel spreadsheet with formulas to keep a track of everything. But are there any tools slash resources you would recommend to make this process less manual? I mean, it's kind of hard. I think you should keep them manual as it keeps you humble. I like, you know, the, I will talk about the tools in a second, but I, I really do think every single person, especially in the first year, track everything even more than you would if you submitted like actual tax documents, keep track of everything, how much you spent on one sleeve, how much you spent on postage to here, or maybe you bought some lunch on the way to the post office. That's all counted in. Just make sure you keep a track of everything. Every card you buy, every card you sell, 
all the fees you paid and understand, then you'll understand how much money you're actually making because that's super important. Most of the times I can figure out what I'm making in my head on the spot pretty easily on most cards, but I've been doing it for such a long time. But I'll talk about me personally. All my stuff is tracked automatically through my website Shop on, on Shopify and it's super helpful. Plus I have my accounting software that automatically links to my bank account that pulls it all in and every normal transaction that normally gets gets kind of filtered automatically into some buckets and they, it does it all for me. My bookkeeper set it all up and my accountant and my business tax accountant, they did it all. I'm not too great at that stuff, but I'm just letting you know that's how I track mine personally. But for you, I do suggest doing manual because it will keep you humble and it will help you understand how much you're actually making. Question number two, I'm planning on using some of my personal collection items as eBay stock once I'm a registered business. How would you record your buy-in cost for these items? These were all purchased with my personal bank account as opposed to a business account. So would you mark the buy-in cost as zero pounds? I hope that makes sense. So this is like kind of tax advice and this, uh, depending on what I say, could be beneficial, not beneficial. And it's completely different for me compared to, I don't know what's beneficial for you because you like, when I started my company, there was a whole bunch of things that we did when I started my company that my business tax account had preferred to me to do. And we did the things that would benefit me. I'm not sure what's beneficial for you. I highly suggest talking to an accountant and see what the laws of UK are and see how you can benefit in those ways. I'm, I'm sorry that I can't help you, but I don't know what's because, you know, I could say mark the buying cost of six, zero dollars, like you mentioned, but then it comes back to bite you in the ass when your tax people say, hey, what the hell happened? Where'd you get items that cost zero dollars? It doesn't make much sense, right? So I uh, can't help you there, buddy. I'm really sorry. Go out of my mouth. Oh, Matt V2834. Just wondering how long is too long for a card to sell? Like at what point should I look at auctioning the card instead in, instead in order to move it quickly and probably take a lower price? So I can buy more cards. I understand the answer will be very based on the card, but for example, some cards I have up for sale include SM12A Tag Teams, Altarts, Rainbows, I think it's just probably due to being a fairly new seller still, but about after about a week of cards being listed, if they haven't sold, I get a little anxious. Oh, appreciate the videos as always. Super helpful, especially the R Steves. Hey, that's what we're doing right now. All right, Matt. So there's a few things to unpack here. One week is definitely way too long to sell a card. I mean, <laughs> way too short to sell some cards. Some cards take a little bit longer, especially if you're not the cheapest price. So... What I've learned over the years from a lot of other eBay sellers that don't sell trading cards is they have sort of like a 30 day system. And some of them are actually quite impressive. You know, when you're selling trading cards, they don't take up much space, right? So even me, I got a whole bunch of trading cards in here. It's only one small room. It's not a big deal. But some people, they sell clothing, they sell shoes, they sell jackets, they sell sea, uh, what is it? Snowboarding equipment, all that other stuff. And or ski equipment. That's what I was going to say. Not snowboarding. What am I doing? What am I, what, what am I actually, what actually am I doing? So what they do is they list the card. They list their items day one. Can I write this? So let's say the calendar starts at day one and it's day 30 down here, right? And we got, we'll do 10. Oh, we'll do this. I'm using the whiteboard for this one because I need to. 10. I'll make these a bit bigger. So we've got 10, 20, 30. So there's day one over here, day 30 down here. They list them here after 10 days because, you know, they have a lot of stuff they needed to sell. They put them in, they kind of list them and put them in date buckets, all that other stuff. We're not going to use that advice here. We're just going to use some of the techniques that I've heard people that want to sell things fast do. They have automatic kind of sales going, but like, you know, sales can only last for 45 days on eBay, I'm pretty sure, but they just like start them again after the end, after like, you know, after like seven days or so. After items listed for 10 days, they find it and then they put it on sale. Maybe they do 10% off. After 20 days, they do 30% off. And after 30 days, they really want it out of their inventory. You know, maybe they didn't make a good sale or a good purchase and they just have 50% off. That's what buy it now. So after this 30 days, if it's 50% off, it doesn't sell. If it reaches 40 days, it just goes auction. 99 cents and uh that is pretty much what i've heard a lot of people do these percentages are different depending on what you sell depending on the rarity of the item if it's a 500 hundred dollar item you probably wouldn't do 50 percent after 30 days maybe it would be a little bit less but 
they have things set in stone that they because when you start a sale you can sort by date listed and they just select it okay this has been listed for 10 days now i'm going to put on a little bit of a sale this has been listed for you know 20 days now i'm going to put even more of a sale and depending on which region and which ebay you're on you can only start sales every seven days on certain items and it's a little bit clunky so bear with me i'm not sure every single ebay they're all a little bit different but that's something you can do if you are anxious and you want to sell things fast. Me personally, like I mentioned earlier in the video, my collection is, is also, my inventory is also part of my collection. A lot of the items I'm actually buying and selling, I'm really interested in, and I'm happy to keep them for the long term. That's really bad financial wise, right? Because I need to sell stuff to make money to like buy more stuff. But I'm fortunate that I've got into this position just by holding things longer than most people might. And then eventually I get a little bit of a kick out of price rises. Like I mentioned with SPR VMAX BSA 10, I might have 20 of them listed, but maybe they're $900 now, but maybe in a year, who the hell knows? Maybe in a year's time, they're $1,800. Maybe they're $2,000. Maybe they're $1,500. I can start selling mine at those prices instead of selling them now because I'm really lucky. But I only got there because I held things for a longer time than maybe most people would. I don't just dump everything straight away, maybe after a week, two weeks. I still get anxious too, man. It's perfectly fine. I definitely have those feelings from time to time. But lately, especially in the last like year and a half, two years, I list stuff, it goes in. I mean, I sold something to oh, I sold something today. Oh, you see, I, I took a photo of it. So I'm I'm trying to find the photo. On my phone, right? Um can can you guys see this? You see you see what this is? I sold this card, Hiker Hidden Fates, 52777 cert. I opened that from a Hidden Fates ETB in like early 2020. I think that was early 2020. I opened that and I submitted the PSA. It took like 12 months. I graded it $8 a card. It sold for $50 buy it now on my site. It has been there for almost three years now. And that isn't very good advice to say like just hold on to things forever, but... Pokemon is incredibly desirable. Everything has a price to someone. You might just have to learn to deal with like keeping things for longer. Some things definitely take more than a week. You know, I'm listing items. Oh, do I have any around? Oh, this is pretty one. This grass energy, super niche promo. Not many people looking for this. I could put this up for $79 and it will most likely sell in the same time period if I put it up for $200 as the current market price, right? That's what everyone has their listed for $200. I could put mine up for $79 shipped and it'll most likely still take the same amount of time to sell. Because if someone's actually looking for that, they're going to look for it at the actual market price. They're going to understand, hey, there's none cheaper. I'm going to try to buy one of this. I'm going to send this guy an offer. I want to try to work for this guy. Some cards, you have. there's no reason to put them on sale. There's no reason to dump them because they're trading cards. They all have their own little markets. They all have their own little good values. But I will say, if you are newer and you're wanting to sell more stuff, I would highly suggest looking at Terra Peak. I mean, I don't have a video on it yet, but we will eventually. Looking at Terra Peak, typing in the cards that you're looking at buying and seeing how many actually sell throughout the month, three months, year, seeing how's it go. You want to, if you want to actually sell stuff and get the feeling of selling stuff, you need to sell what's popular. You need to sell what people actually want, and then use that information to actually find stuff to, to buy that people actually want. But if everyone wants it, that means everyone's looking for it. And the margins are going to be way lower. Just like I mentioned with this, eventually this card is going to be like $10 PSA 10 margin. It will not be worth grading this card eventually, but then in six months or 12 months after it's not worth grading, it suddenly does become worth grading because everyone stopped grading it. And now it's worth a little bit more the PSA 10 versus the raw. Does that make sense? I feel like um, I hope I'm hitting the nail on the head here. So I hope that helps you, Matty. Thanks for all the support all the time, by the way. Tatsu Loto. How do you deal with buyers backing out of a sale and bid listings just stretch my leg <laughs> and bid listings going way below your expectations? Oh, man. So first of all, buyers backing out of a sale. Man, that's just how it is. I mean, if you if you're working in this industry, people will say, hey, I want to buy that and they want to buy this and they want to buy that and they want to buy that. And they're telling 10 different people that they know they can't buy it all, but they like the feeling, right? And that's just how it is. Everyone likes window shopping. It's Oh my God, it's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It does suck when people back out. I've had many, many people back out. I had a you know $20,000 trophy deal last month. The guy paid me a thousand dollars down payment backed out at the end of the month. You know, I was considered, I was like 
as a human being, I was like, okay, I'm going to have 20 grand extra to spend at the end of the month. This is going to be awesome. I can buy a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe I can buy something cool for my collection. Messages me. Hey, I can't buy. I sent him his money back. Not a big deal. This shit happens, right? I could have kept his money, but I didn't because I'm not that guy. But it's um sometimes people back out of deals, man. As a seller, you have to learn to keep your emotions intact. Do better. I actually had my emotion, emotions lapse today. Terribly. I had someone buy something off me. They realized it was the wrong item. They opened a return case. They don't understand how returns work on eBay. They thought that they had to pay postage back to me. They thought it was like $35. They left me negative feedback. They sent me messages and insulting me. And I'm sitting there like, you bought the wrong item. You acknowledge that you did the wrong thing, but it's my fault that you have to send it back to me. And I got really pissed off today. I usually don't, but I got really pissed off today. And as a seller, taking the hits, because there's going to be a lot of them. There's a shitload of hits, especially if you're taking this seriously and you're wanting to grow and you're wanting to expand and your mind and mental is in it. And it's all you can think about is selling. You will get pissed off quite often, but eventually you learn to deal with these things. I haven't had one of these scenarios happen in a while and it caught me off guard on a pretty average day. Maybe I had bad sleep. I mean, I should start sleeping earlier. What's the time now? I don't even know. But, you know, look at that. See that? Look at that. 2.05 a.m. But got to do this, ask Steve. It's more important than my sleep. <laughs> um, and bid listings going way below your expectations. I used to always auction items off, right? Start them at 99 cents, start them at $10, start them at $20. And what I've realized is that's a terrible idea. If you're trying to make something consistent, you're trying to make money, it's a bad idea. Yes, sometimes it is cause to sell items on auction, sell them a little bit lower than what they're worth, maybe lower the market value just to get money in because you need to buy more stuff and you need to pay for your bills. That's perfectly fine. As you can see here, let me get rid of these notifications. All these uh, eBay notifications here. Oh, my screen's a bit bright. I'm sorry. All my eBay notifications here. Relist, 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 relist. They're all auction listings that I started too high. But does it bother me? No, because I built up to a certain point where I don't need to dump constantly and get money back. What do I do with those items? If they, didn't get a, if they didn't get a bid, I put them up at like 75. Next time I auction them off, I'll just start them at 60. I'll just start them at 55. I will say some items that I started this time around, I auctioned off last week and the week before and the week before at the same price. You know what, ha you know what happened? You know what happened? They got a bid this time at the same starting price than they did. That's the beauty of trading cards. Like I said, with the grass energy, sometimes the person's not looking for that item. Sometimes the same person pays $1 and the same person pays $100 on the same card, just depending on when it's available and how much it is. You guys might disagree with me, but I've sold cards over time for $60, $70, $80. They were also listed on eBay for $29, $24, $25. Out of pure luck, just because I had the listing there and I had it listed at a price and the buyer was happy with the one that I had for sale. Sometimes they want to pay a little bit more for a little bit better condition. Sometimes they want to pay a little bit more because it's in the same country. Sometimes there's, you, never, you don't know the psychology behind the other people who want to buy the items. All you can do is control what you can control. So auctions going way below your bid listings, lower than expectations, just start them higher. That's all I can say. Now, when it does happen, it sucks, but you just ship the item, move on. Try to use the money you got to build more value. Sometimes you can lose $10 and that $10 will make you $50 in the future. It's not the end of the world. Dumping stuff sometimes is apparent. It's uh, it's it's very um, useful to dump stuff sometimes. But we can't break even and lose money all the time. Eventually we have to make some money, right? So I've counteracted that. I have a whole bunch. If I move this. Do you guys see this shelf? There's around 600 PSA cards on those two shelves that are my auction cards. Cards that I deem not to be worth listing by it now as I don't want to inventorize them, don't want to keep them forever, but I want to put them as my forever auctions that just go for 75. And then I can adjust the prices a lot more easier. They're a lot more clumped. And I could just put, if I one day I want to get rid of all of them, I can auction them up for 99 cents. For now, I'm happy to start them at 75, $60, $50. But for eventually, I will do 99 cents if I just want to get rid of all of them. Kind of like this. First auction is $50, second auction $40, third auction $30, fifth, fourth auction $20. Eventually that will get a bid, but at least you won't just list them at $1 on the first day and it goes to like $9. You try it a few more times. No one cares, no one's mad. And there might be a few people that are mad to see the same card on auction every day, 
But you never know. Some people work. Some people don't check eBay every day. The right buyer might check on the second, seventh, and the ninth day of the month only. That's the guy who wants your card. But you listed it on the 14th day for $1 and he never saw it. So I hope that what I said makes sense. Maybe I'm maybe I'm coming delusional because it's getting really late. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Are these videos even worth watching? Does anyone even watch these or listen to them? Like, is this even on? Like, come on. I'm going to need some positive reinforcement after this. I'm going to move my mouse. There we go. All right. Raichu Skater 69. What's up, buddy? Hey, Steve. I've been getting into the Pikachu plushies since finding them at the Pokemon Center while traveling Japan. They are so fun and cute. I agree with you. How are we going to get the new Van Gogh Pikachu plush? I don't know, bro. That was a shit show, that Van Gogh stuff. Am I right? Holy shit. P.S. What do you think about the PSA 10 market holding up with its premiums in the future? And in future, do you think super clean raw cards will ever compete with greater card premiums? Thanks for everything you do, dude. So I definitely think there is a world where super clean raw cards, they will never meet the price of the graded card, but they will meet the price of the graded card less grading. And what that means is, like I said with this, this card right here, $130 PSA 10, $130 Australian dollars, but $60, $70 raw, it costs $30 to grade. It's, it's a little bit more for me because I'm paying taxes business all this other stuff um and I, I don't like under the it's whatever it's 30 dollars australian to grade the usd is in the shit compared to australia i'm getting destroyed right so the margin is around 20 to 25 dollars but it's three months to grade two months to grade if this got graded in one week the margin wouldn't even exist because there would be so many available and now that people bought the card and graded it they're even more willing to sell it and they want to sell it to get their money back so grading has two things that creates the two things <laughs> grading has two things that creates the margin the time it takes to grade which is number one for 99 percent of the cards mass modern all the stuff that everyone sees all the time number two is the condition if it's an older card gem mint's harder to get the grading is going to make the price rise but for almost every card the pricing grading is only because the cumbersome to submit it and is that even the word I'm looking for? How cumbersome it is to submit it and the two month, three month wait time. That's why when we saw prices explode so much when it was 12, 15, 18 months to get cards back from PSA, because what are you doing? Ugh, what are you doing? <laughs> Check out my cat. She only got one eye. She doesn't like being held. <laughs> hey, baby. Oh, I'm putting you back down. She breathes really heavy. She goes, <laughs> I don't know if the video can hear that, but. Yeah, she breathes really heavy, and it's kind of funny when she's walking around. But, um, yeah, I hope that explains that question for you, buddy. Joey makes videos. 2NE87. Struggling putting any money in my pocket rather than dumping it back all into the hustle. When operating from a business standpoint like yourself, how much should you pay yourself with? Is there a certain percentage you keep out of each sale? All right, Joey. First part of this question. You should never, ever pay yourself selling your trading cards. That's my opinion. Whatever. Secondly, you should have a job that covers all your living expenses and everything you do. You are not allowed to gorge yourself or enjoy the profits that you make from trading cards. <laughs> Sounds bad when I say it like that. The whole idea of selling a trading card is to buy another trading card. I will stick by that forever. I have said that forever and it will be like it is forever. Money has goals when it buys you nice stuff, buys you a house, helps you with your family, all that other stuff. That's great. You should be doing a job I don't currently do a job because I run two pretty big stores and we spend hundreds of thousand dollars, sometimes most months, just to keep them going and keep the sales going. It's uh, kind of crazy and I'm pretty sure most of the time I'm probably better off just working on the job. But you should have a normal job that pays all your wages, pays all your bills, pays all the stuff, right? If you ever sell a trading card, you should put that back into trading cards. That's all I would ever, ever advise. I know it sucks to dump it all back in the hustle. I've been doing this for eight years now, pretty steadily. And all I've ever done is dump it all back into the hustle. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, I'm up at 2 a.m. talking into a camera. Um, yeah, I always thought my life would get better once I started selling more. Once I was worth a million dollars. Because apparently that's the thing. Once you become a millionaire, apparently, life gets better. Well, if you're addicted to the hustle and life is great and you just want to sell and sell and sell, you're always going to, if you ever stop, you ever take some money out, you oh, I'm going to go out tonight. Or I'm going to go to a holiday. You're always going to think, man, if I didn't spend that money, 
If I didn't spend that money, I could have bought that stuff off. Oh, spend... And it's a terrible feeling, but you're never going to get rid of it. It isn't an un... Cats are going crazy. It isn't a feeling that's bad per se, but it's always going to be there. I'm still thinking now, why do they go to Japan? It cost me like $10,000, me and my partner, to go there for a few weeks. It was terrible. But you have to live life sometimes, but you will always have that voice in the back of your head. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Why did I spend on that? Or should I take some out? Spend Because a lot of people, they buy and sell, they buy and sell. They make a little bit of profit. They go out, they buy something. They make a little profit, they go out, they buy something. Surely, some people that are a little bit more controlled than me, I put everything back in. I, I'm crazy. I might close the door. I put everything back in for years. Like, for years, I put everything back in. I was getting paid for my job. The whole paycheck was going to the Pokemon. Any sale from Pokemon... Everything going into the Pokemon. I know so many people have done that. They've done really well, but it's extremely stressful, man. So maybe you can start off paying yourself 20% of the profit from every time you make a sale. And if that, you know, if that money starts to become, hey, why am I putting away this money? If that doesn't work for you, adjust it to 10. If that doesn't work for you, adjust it to five. Eventually adjust it to zero if you realize that you just want to buy more and hustle and hustle and hustle and grind and What's the other words that the kids use these days? I don't fucking know. <laughs> I'm too old for this shit. But how much should you pay yourself is depending on you. If you have a lot of bills and you have family that needs help, you have to pay for those things first, right? But I suggest getting yourself to the position where your job pays for everything you need and your cards and your side hustle and your inventory and everything that I talk about builds more of that. Because... Selling stuff is really fun. And having a lot of stuff is also really fun. And that's pretty much the best I can do. Overhaul in 27. How do you pack your slaps after sold on eBay? Love your content. Um, I think you mean slaps. But I think I replied to this message with a uh, video about how I pack my stuff. But why don't we just do one? We just do a lot. Let me get the shipping materials real quick. So first things first, you should have all your shipping materials in the same location. So when you want to pack something, you don't have to get this from this drawer, that from that shelf, this from this shelf, walk around, waste a bunch of time. This is all I use. It's four different things. Or five, because we need the card. How about we pack one of these V-Star bad boys, right? First thing, I have a small little piece of bubble. Goes in. Super easy. I have a small box. It's a die cut box. So I, I make these myself. They come flat packed. But then I put them together. Super great. This slides in there. It's really good. This, uh, this, uh, what is this? This die cut box, whatever it's called, is super solid. You can see on the front here, I can squeeze this with my fingers as much as I can. And it's, uh, really, really tough because cardboards are quite tough and the cards inside. And, you know, I can barely even crush the corners even if I tried. I'm not a big dude. I can't crush skulls, but it's really solid. If I slap this around, if I slam it on the ground, it's going to be pretty protected. One extra thing I do is if it's a cheaper card, a hundred dollars or so, I just put one layer of bubble wrap around it, and then I chuck it in this courier bag to keep this stuff uh, waterproof. That's pretty much it. If it's more expensive, I put more bubble wrap around it. If it's more and more expensive, I chuck it in a small box. So I put this inside the small box. So it still says this is the baseline, and then I put this in the small box. So I'll open this up. I mean, you saw me crunch it. Hopefully it's not cracked. That'd be actually hilarious. But PSA cases are pretty strong. Card's perfect. We've used this card a lot in this video. So if you buy this card, I'll send it. If you buy one of these from me, this is the 585 set from the Ask Steve number 12. Oh, God. There you go. That's me packing. Hawking Mass. What specifically are the requirements for getting lower fees on eBay that large sellers get? I couldn't find them part of the top seller list program. So I'm assuming these kind of deals are one-offs made on a case-by-case. -case. Is this true? I have no idea. If you are an eBay seller in Australia, each store gives you a little bit percentage fees off. In America, that's not true. I had a look into that the other day, actually. American stores don't give you a fee discount. But Americans get fee discounts on more expensive items. So I have the same fees, whether for an item is $5,000 or if it's $100. Americans get like 2% fees if it's over like $2,500 $2, or something like that. It probably all averages out. Every eBay is completely different. I know of some eBay sellers, like probably TCA Gaming, Z and G, they probably sell a million every like three months, auctioning off other people's stuff. eBay notices that, they give them a discount. 
That's just how it is. I don't know how you get them. I'm not in uh, eBay US. I don't have an eBay discount. My eBay fees are like 9.4% or something. Um, let me double check for you. But I have the second store in Australia, like the like the advanced store. I don't have like the $300 a month one. I have the $75 a month one. And I'll show you right now, just so you know that I'm not like, you know, completely messing with you. Because even if I tell people something sometimes, I go, hey, this is what it is. They go, he's still holding something from me. I know he's holding something from me. So this right here. See, 9.4% fee for selling this item at uh, $470. And an extra 1% because they're international. That's awesome. You guys are from the United States. I have to pay an extra 1% in fees. That's great. So it's 10.4% in fees. And then I have to pay GST on my fees, which is a 10% extra. And that's 11.5% in fees or whatever the hell it is. I don't, I don't fucking know. But no big deal. You can see I sold the item for $460 and I got paid $415. That's pretty cool. What did I sell? This sold just before. Oh, you guys probably haven't seen this return yet, but I sold this for $460. That's good profit. That's when grading cards really comes in well. Uh, comes in well? Comes in well? Comes in, what? Come, what am I coming in? Um, That's when graded cards are really good. You find a card that's quite rare. It's quite niche. And this is a 2010 reverse foil Nitto King from Clash of the Summit. It cost me, I think that card cost me $77. If I had to give you the honest answer, I think it's $77 with the collection purchase plus the grading fee, Australian dollars, 77 after fees is 415 I made 300 and whatever that is, $340 or something like that. That's impressive. That's a good margin. That's a great card. Can I sell 10 of those at that price? Probably not. I know the guy that bought that. He's trying to complete all the reverses. I listed the one that he needed. That's how it is. We just did that live. That's pretty good. That's the end of this page. <clears throat> wow, this is a... Hmm. Long ass video. Hi, Steve. I live in Australia and I've been recently selling loads of cards. Hell yeah, brother. You taking my business. You're making me go out of business. <laughs> I'm kidding. I heard you say that off an $8 card sale, you make six after shipping and fees. At the moment, I'm using small green tracked envelopes from Australia Post stores and they're almost $4 each. Can you explain the cheapest method of track shipping for cards and how do you ship them in Australia? So that is the cheapest for track shipping in Australia. It's $4. It's complete bullshit. And America has like a 50 cents option. And I wish we had that here too. But unfortunately, Australia Post is corrupt and is not even owned by the Australian government. And that's just how it is. So in saying that, you can, if you want to ship parcels cheaper, you can sign up for a My Post business account through Australia Post. Go to your local Australia Post. They'll know what to do. Man, these hiccups, man. I'm so fucking angry at these. Yeah. They'll tell you what to do. Go there. Talk to them. They'll give you a business account. You don't need an ABN or anything like that. You can just do it with your own details. And then you can ship two parcels, three parcels a week and get them a little bit ship cheaper than the average. But the cheapest track shipping is the $3.80 tracked envelopes. Plus you need to sell them at like, you need to charge like at least like $4 in postage. Otherwise you're completely going to lose money. So yeah, like I said, if I sell an $8 card after shipping, I usually, if I'm selling an $8 card, I'm usually charging shipping. So like the buyer pays shipping and then after that I get $6. I don't uh, do free shipping on my singles account as I couldn't sell a $2 single with free shipping and it's tracked. I'll never use an untracked shipment because everyone just claims that they don't arrive and you just get scammed and it pisses me off. So everyone has to pay $4. Unfortunately, it is a tax on collectors to buy stuff online with really high shipping prices and it really annoys me every day. All this money that doesn't go to collectors and then the seller to buy more cards from other collectors and then it's whatever. But that's the cheapest way, mate. Sorry. Eventually, if you do a lot of sales and you can sell a lot, you get higher on the My Post business. And then eventually, if you're like me, you get to be on a parcel send contract. And I have the cheapest shipping rates in Australia for overseas shipping. That's why on graded cards, I could do $10 shipping to the US, you know, 15 to the European places, 21 to some places in Europe. I have the cheapest shipping because it only costs me $11.70 $11 to ship to the US and I charge them 10, you know, even till I still lose money shipping to the US. I love you guys. That's just how it is. But yeah, eventually when you sell a lot, they can give you big discounts on the parcels. But unfortunately, $4 for tracked envelopes is the best we got. 
Oh, Kirke, what do you recommend is the best way to deal with bulk? Just bunch of auctions or list individually as bin. It's maybe a few thousand cards, but a bunch of older Wizards of the Coast, random cards here and there till the start of XY. I bought a few collections of eBay and they came with Japanese bulk as well, but it's such a pain to list every single card. Yeah, definitely is. <laughs> um, so when you're selling bulk, the more you sell, well, this is with bulk non holo cards, generally, the more you sell, the less you get per card. So if you sell one card, you can get up, you can sometimes get $2 for a random bulk non holo card. Sometimes get $5 if it's a really cool card. But you can sell 100 cards in a lot, and maybe you only get $10, $12. You sell 1,000 cards, maybe you can only get $25, $30. So the margin is exceptionally lower per card the more you sell, because you're selling more and having to do less work. Now, if you only have a few thousand cards, what I recommend you do is just get 100 cards spread them out, make them look nice in an eBay listing. If they are all from older Wizards of the Coast and random cards here and there, maybe sort them out a little bit or don't sort them out. Maybe it's a little bit more fun for some people. They get a little bit of cards Japanese, a little bit from Wizards of the Coast, a little bit from XY. Spread them out, 100 card lots to have nice listings. Start them all on eBay for $19.99. You get 20 cents per card, which is almost the same amount you would get if you sold a $1.50 single with free shipping or $2. If you're only in the US and you sell something for $2 with free shipping, I think you make like 30 cents. So if you sell 100 cards for $20 and you get like 20 cents each for the cards, you're saving a lot of work and not even getting, like you're getting almost the same amount as a single seller. So um, I can recommend just making 100 card lots. You only got like 4,000, it's 40 lots. You can do it. It's not that much work. I believe in you. Don't be lazy. And then just start them at $19.99, put them on auction and just keep auctioning them forever and ever and ever until they eventually sell. They will eventually sell. Everyone loves trading cards. It might take a while, but it will eventually sell. Hope that helps. Moose Juice 69, great video. Can I ask what scanner or software you use for your raw cards? I'm gonna write it so you can understand what I'm saying. I don't know where my pen went. All right, we're using blue. So I use a V370 uh, Epson, all right? That's the graded cards. This is the graded. For the ungraded cards, I use the The Fujitsu 8170. And this scanner is literally insane. It also cost me like $1,500. So this is not for the faint-hearted. It's also called the Ricoh 8170 because they rebranded to Ricoh. For whatever reason, Fujitsu is now Ricoh. So this is the raw card scanner. This is the graded scanner. Take a screenshot. Take a screenshot of me. Release your desktop background. All right. The Hoenn Bazaar. What's going on? With the raw card scanner. Hey, how good is that? A question... About the roll card right after. That's pretty good. Do you ever get print lines from the cards getting sucked through the machine? I got a cheaper Rico slash Fujitsu. Hey, you even wrote that in there. And it's definitely damaging my cards. Tested on some energies first, thankfully. So this scanner, 8170, 7170. Look it up on YouTube. There's heaps of videos on this scanner. This scanner was pretty much designed for trading cards in mine. There's plenty of software to make trading card scanning a lot easier with those scanners. I will say scanners there's a lot of they're constantly things running through right i'm selling a lot of damage and play cards all the time they have gunk on them they're a little bit dirty a little bit dusty even the room is dusty just the room existing dust is falling getting caught on the scanner rolls it's going through eventually that will transfer the card what i notice on my cards with my scanner sometimes i'll have a line of like dust or like just something on it from the roller marks of the scanner rolling onto the card it doesn't damage my cards. I haven't noticed any damage. I have had an old Fujitsu Snap Scan scanner, IX400, I think it was called, that definitely damaged cards. I stopped using that, but like a year and a half ago. But this uh, this one, as far as I'm aware, doesn't damage cards. Now, if you run the same card in this scanner 30, 40, 50 times, maybe there's a chance it gets scan uh, damaged, but that's the best advice I can give you. Also, don't buy the same scanner as me because then we're going to have the same photos. Okay. I like my photos being really good. <laughs> Don't copy everything I do. I need to be a little bit more unique. You guys are going to put me out of business. <laughs> Friendly neighborhood Viking. Hey, Steve. I'm curious about what programs you use to track your inventory. So my website tracks everything I need. The one thing it doesn't track is how much I pay for things, but that's something else separate that I use like a overall payment of certain everything. I have other software that through my accounting software, I use MYOB. 
it's a very old system, but it's what my bookkeeper is good with. But you can use other things and whatever that. Zero is a really good one. All these other things. Um, it tracks like overall expenditure when it's like card purchasing, overall expenditure when it's like postage. But it's really hard when you get to year one, two, three, four, five. As I'm selling things, like I mentioned, I sold that hiker from three years ago. That was purchased three years ago. That's part of that year. <coughs> Sorry. And now I'm selling things now. But... I would suggest doing it every week, every month, keeping on top of it, understanding your finances when you're earlier on. It's way more important than automating it for sure. <laughs> but you talk about tracking inventory, but yeah, my website does pretty much all of it. And eBay does all of it for my single cards. I don't think you really need much more. Unless you're talking about backstock and I don't track inventory backstock. That's a waste of fucking time. <laughs> I'm trying to make money. I'm not trying to lose money and uh, waste my time. So inventory backstock for me, I don't track that. I use this thing up here to track my backstock inventory because a wise man once told me a long time ago, focus on the things making you money first. Until you have so much money, you can focus on the things that don't make you money. Backstock tracking doesn't make me money. I'm focusing on things that do make me money because I need money, right? I need money. Money's the best. I need money because I need to buy more cards. I need to pay my bills. I hope that helps. Oh, Pharrell. Hello, Steve, my good friend. I have a question for you. How often are you getting back PSA submissions? Uh, at the moment, looks like every few days, but in the future, it'll probably be three months until I get my next submission after my last six. I only have six submissions still left at PSA, and I'll probably submit again maybe late November as I want to get through the Christmas period. I want to get through to January, February. I have so many raw cards to deal with. I can't I honestly, it's it's like, it's going to sound bad, but I can't be fucked. <laughs> I can't be fucked doing a PSA submission. And I just don't care about like getting the cards back until March, April, May, June. A lot of cards, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with grading over it goes over the December. I don't know what next year is going to look like as a selling outlook. I'm trying to keep my cash levels high to keep buying more collections and stack on raw cards. I'm not sure how much I'm going to grade. But how often do I get back PSA submissions? Usually when I send, I send like 10 submissions in the same box. And then those 10 submissions come to me over the month. So usually every like three or four days, I get a little bit of cards to come in and uh, check them out. But like in the future, it's going to be not many. It just depends on how many submissions I actually send out. TJ Colts. If I'm just starting out on eBay, at what point would you say to have your own site is worth it at all? I realize there's a trade-off for eBay 13% fees, but I feel like making a sale on your own site has to feel a little bit better than paying 4% or whatever it costs. Maybe there compared to eBay 13%. Having your YouTube advertising the cards helps. But yeah, I'd appreciate if you could elaborate on the whole website pros and cons. Thanks, Steve. You're the best. Love you. Love you too, man. All right. Maybe I can help with this. So, right, this helps get all this off. So, I started my website in 2019. I'm going to first start this off with saying I regret starting my website. So, I regret starting my website and I regret it now. I didn't regret it in the moment. I regret starting my website. It is not worth it for me to have my website. Um, I can't really stop using my website as that's so crucial to do what I'm doing. If I had to stop using my website, I'd probably have to relist everything I own and that would really suck. So, because my website costs me a generous amount every month, probably an extra 300 to $400 in fees. But let's explain the reason why I did it. So when I first started my website, Shopify, at least a platform, it was so much easier to bulk list cards. So easier to list. So list. That is a S. So for pro, gone. I feel like you can see that, right? Well, that's really bad. Why can't you see that? You can see that. Pros, con. So listing was way easier for my website. When it first started, it's still really easy to list on my website because eBay's pages load so slow. But the cons of the website is no feedback. And no feedback. I forgot to put the C. So no feedback when people buy off a website. Pro for my website is there's no for sales tax. All right. So this is going to be a bit dodgy, but I'm surely there's no one from any government body watching this video an hour and 20 minutes in. So when people buy off me, there's sales tax from all around the world. I, I pretty much noticed when eBay started forcing sales tax on all the countries in 2019, 2020, I was like, man, I got to have another avenue because, you know, I want to do 
offsite eBay sales to help people out because you know people in the UK and Europe they pay like a ridiculous amount of extra tax and it's honestly it fucking annoys me. It should stay in the collector's hands, but it doesn't. It's just so much wasted fees. So tax, there's no forced tax on my website and I mark down items. So it was beneficial to the buyers. Now, I don't get any extra money when people buy off my website. Not all the time. Right now I'm running a sale and the prices are very, very close. And if you do buy off my website, it's way more beneficial to me. But you also save money too if you have a forced tax kind of thing. So I don't get any benefit to me other than the sale happening. So more like the sale happens. You know, the, the price is on eBay at $100 plus the buyer has to pay like $20 tax or $15 tax or the listing on my website is $90 with no tax. We don't include shipping because it's not relevant. The buyer has to pay $120 or they have to pay $90. The sale happens because they get to pay $90. That's pretty, pretty easy to understand. Definitely does feel good when I sell on my website. My website selling fees are 2%. I think they're 2% anyway. I'm pretty sure they're 2%. My eBay fees are like, you know, like I said, 9.4. So the sale actually happens, but I don't get any feedback. I've had maybe 40 to 50,000 sales on my website that don't even show on my eBay. And I wish it could show on my eBay because then I'd have a huge number and it would inflate my ego and I'd feel really good. But I don't get any feedback. That's a, that's a bad thing. It's a... Uh... So when I have a website, it's harder to manage. It's two platforms that I'm currently managing. I'm managing a website and I'm managing eBay. Got to check sales on both. Got to make sure both look good. My website at the moment, I honestly think looks fucking trash. It is absolute dog shit. I know I'm swearing a lot in this video, but I'm late. I'm tired and I'm a little bit rowdy. I had a few drinks. So it's hard to manage my website and the eBay because I have to make sure my eBay store looks good. And I have to make sure my website looks good. And I got to make them both looking good. And then I got to control the prices between it. So if it's $100 on my website, sometimes I list it on eBay for 115 to counteract all those fees and stuff like that. So eBay is more of like an advertising point for my website. But honestly, I feel like now the current selling sphere, having just an eBay is not only more than fine, it is the best thing you could possibly do because it's cheapest. It doesn't cost anything. You pay a store fee that's very, very minimal. You only to pay fees when you sell items. It's honestly amazing. So that's pretty much everything. I don't really know what else to add on to it. I also say I also separate the single card and the greater card store just because of this. If I didn't have this, I would put all my single cards on my greater card store. But because I have the website, it is way too much effort for all my default policies, default shipping, default looks. Everything is so much easier to have separate. Now I have to pay another eBay fee. And then it's another store that I can't combine my sales and flex and feel really good. It's a... Uh, Kind of annoying. <laughs> How many questions have we got left? Oh, only like three more. Well, that's pretty good. Comp DR 223. Selling raw cards. No refunds accepted. Buyer wants to refund a card. Shows pick of surface damage I've never seen before. How do I handle? Shut up and take the loss or fight this bullshit? Ha ha, thank you, XOXO. <laughs> what are you guys doing with all this love you and XOXO stuff? It's kind of weird, right? Um, so first of all, you're on eBay. You got to accept things no matter what. Like I said, I've, I've talked about this pretty heavily earlier. It sucks. Things happen. You have to learn to take the shit, learn to learn to shut up and take the loss. Now, the best thing you can do is answer the return request or whatever by like, look, I'm more than happy to return that item. Please ship it back to me. Start a return or this is my shipping address. Send it back to this and I'll refund you when I get it back. Perfectly fine to do. It's going to happen. It's not going to handle all, happen all the time. When you get it back, assess the damage. Try and really figure out, did you actually miss it? Or was it there? Was it not there? Was it shipping? Was it this? Did you ship it badly? Try to assess what actually went wrong. Maybe it never actually happened. And maybe they damaged the card. You never know. Maybe they sent you the wrong card. Those are the things you can figure out afterwards. But unfortunately, you sell on eBay. You have to accept the returns. It's the only reason why selling on eBay is actually viable. Because people can buy off eBay and they can feel safe. That's the only reason why the platform works. So it's unfortunate, but you just got to learn to take them as it is. Should I make a video on like all the bad things that can happen to a seller and how to deal with them? Should I do that? Is anyone even watching? Do I look completely like destroyed right now? <laughs> oh man, there's so many bags under my eyes. Oh, I'm getting too old for this. Not really. We're still starting. We're starting out. Grumble Gamer, any suggestions on where to buy envelopes on bubble wrap in bulk? That's a great question. Uh, we're in probably different countries, so it's not really relevant information. I highly suggest going on eBay typing in envelopes the size you need 
times 100 times 1000. There's going to be so many websites that have their website linked to eBay. They're going to have all their documentation on there, all their logos, everything on their username will probably be their website name. Type that name into Google, go to their website, assess the price there. It should be cheaper. Sort lowest price to highest price. Look at the lowest, go from there. That's all I can recommend. That's probably the best thing you could possibly do. For anything, really, honestly. I am John Reed. I know you love Pokemon cards and collect yourself. But I'm sure you can become desensitized to a lot, even the cooler cards, as you're around them so much. What do you personally collect? A collection video would be sick. Anyway, love your videos. Keep it up. So I have a whole bunch of videos actually showing a few cards from my collection. I don't really want to make this this YouTube channel like this thing where I just have all my collection and show everything off. I'm already showing off all my greater cards, a lot of the mail days I purchased. But do remember what I personally collect, you know, rare Japanese cards. And um, that shit's boring. I honestly don't like it that much. I did like it for a whole bunch of time. But there is like, I don't know how to say this, but there's like, oh, this is going to sound really bad. And no one's watching it an hour and 30 past. But when it comes to collecting rare Pokemon cards, expensive Pokemon cards, there is so many fucking wankers, like honest to God wankers, that are like collecting this stuff that have, like, like myself, I'm a huge wanker, that it just becomes unenjoyable to share that love for those items with those people because they think they're so superior because they like something that's a little bit more expensive. They think they're so superior because they have something that's a little bit rare. It's just like, oh my god, bro, no one cares. You got an expensive item that's absolutely useless. It's a trading card, and you spend so much money on it, and you think it's cool. In saying that, I do like the rarer stuff, because I have a lot more money than I used to, and I never know. Maybe this whole thing stops tomorrow, and then I'm happy because I got the chance to buy all this super rare stuff, and my life crashes to zero, all the prices crash to zero. I got to enjoy life, and I'll reminisce until I'm 90 years old, until I die. I'm happy that I have some rare Japanese cards, because that's all I really wanted. But, like I said, everything I have is an extension of myself. All these cards on these shelves, all these plushies. L look at this. I'm going to show this an hour and a half from that into the video. You know what this is? This is one of the first Pokemon blocks that they made. I think Ishihara has a photo. Or he's in his office. And he has one of these on his shelf 25 years ago. Look how brown this thing is. Look at the plastic, it's supposed to be clear. It's just brown from just sun damage and just dirt over the years piling up. I bought this for 780 yen. Look how cool this is. I've had this for four and a half years now, I think. It has been on the shelf or on display in every single place that I've been and I've lived in. This is one of my most cherished and favorite items and it is literally five bucks. Like, it's... I like to collect stuff that makes me feel good. Yeah, I got to have a lot of expensive items. Yeah, I pay a lot of money for a lot of things. But end of the day, when you go up the totem pole and you collect things that are like more expensive and more expensive and more expensive, the people you have to deal with and be around to like share that space with, they're so annoying. Like honestly, man, like they're so annoying. So I like to collect cheaper stuff usually for myself because it's like so much more fun to handle. I got this other, like, I'll show some things. See, this, like, this isn't, uh, this isn't, like, cool, and it's not clickbait, and it doesn't, like, get you likes, but this Pikachu plush is done by Tomokazu Kamiya, one of my favorite artists. I've actually met him in person. He's a great guy. We talk almost daily. He's awesome. This is a Pikachu plushie. I bought this for, like, $35. It's, like, seven years old. I only learned about this about a year and a half ago, so I got one, and I love it. And I have this on display also. And this car, this this plushie means way more to me than my Snap Charmander, my Snap Coughing, one of the 35 Pokemon Japanese trophies I have. It's like those things, I might have spent 300, what, 300, 400, 500 thousand dollars on them. They, they, I don't even know if I like them anymore. I'm probably going to start selling them all and buying more stuff like that and putting it on display that I actually enjoy. Buying more artwork, buying things that actually make me feel good and to be in the space. Not tucked away in like bank vaults, not tucked away in PWCC vaults. And I'm so stressed about it. Like, what the, is the price going to go up or down? Is someone going to list a Snap Charmander for forty thousand, and I'll put double pay double the price? Like, I don't know. Now I'm just ranting because I'm I'm tired. But like, you know what I mean? What do I collect myself? I collect stuff that makes me feel good. At the time when I bought that Charmander, it was an extremely feel good moment. I still feel good when I when I look at that. You know, when I look at the pictures of it online. <laughs> 
And I still feel good because it's a little but it's a bunch of one dollar cards that I shipped out over and over and over again and eventually that I build up all over time and I converted it into one crazy hyper rare card. It'll probably be my most expensive card forever. But that plushie, that clock, these plushies, eight dollars, ten dollars each. That drawing of Rusty Rusty at the back there. They mean a whole lot more to me than an expensive card in a vault somewhere. So my name's Steve. That was our Steve. Number 12. Leave some comments. <laughs> Let's get to the next one, all right? Let's get to our, sir, our Steve 13 without it being three weeks this time. Um, man, look at my hair. I might have a haircut next time. No, I'm not doing a haircut ever again. That was a bad month, right? Am I right? Holy crap. All right, thanks so much, guys. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.